Welcome to our weekly podcast on Kentucky sports. We'll be talking basketball today. Stuart Lackey joins me as my guest. As usual, we will talk about Kentucky's loss to Florida, Kentucky's game ahead with Tennessee, and a little bit more before we get to Stuart. A reminder, this is brought to you by Bet Online. It's playoff time. The road to Vegas goes through San Francisco and Baltimore. Bet Online is your number one source for playoff odds. Stats, trends, and lines with everything from point spreads to hundreds of player performance props. Head to Bet Online today. Stay updated on all the action. Bet Online. The game starts here. Stuart, welcome. It's been an interesting year in SEC basketball. Uh, just as a general observation, I think the league, top to bottom, is as interesting as it's been in a long time. A lot of games in the in the eighties and nineties, which I love. That's my favorite brand of basketball. Kentucky yeah. certainly plays a lot of those kind of games, which makes the the Cats a team to watch just for that reason alone. And unfortunately for Kentucky, got called in one of those games last night with a like-minded team and and came up just short. Your your thoughts, first of all, welcome. Second of all, on on Florida's loss to – it was a little rude. I went went to Mint 20 and didn't welcome you yet. But uh, (laughs) – but and lost to Florida. But anyway, go ahead. No, great to great to be with you as always. Yeah, Cats fall to 15 and 5, Chris, on the season. And and really a game that I think most people thought Kentucky would win and honestly should have won when you think about putting together a tournament resume. Um, and and with a you know a team like Tennessee coming into Rupp Arena on Saturday, I think you know, Kentucky was down a couple of key players. Uh, one other player that's I think got some lingering issues we can get into. And I think Florida, as we spoke of before we went on the air today, uh, beat Kentucky at its own game a little bit. Um, you know, 94-91 final score, I think surprised a lot of people. But the league is as balanced as it's been in a long time. There's a reason why experts pick, I guess, what, seven or eight teams to make the tournament this year from, yeah. from the conference. Let's start with the, a lineup thing. DJ Wagner didn't play last night. The second game he hasn't played all season, I think. Let me double check that. That's correct. That's right. Last time against Arkansas, eight points in a win. Before that, four points against South Carolina in a win. Before that, 18 points against Georgia. I think that was right about the time, or maybe it was a week before, when he'd been SEC Player of the Week. His absence changed some things for the lineup. One, one of the positives was that Reed Shepard got more playing time. I felt like he hadn't been on the floor enough, and, and boy, did right. Shepard have a game. But the, the Wagner dynamic, um, where do you where do you think this is headed? How did that affect Kentucky last night? Right. Second game, he, he did not play. Um, they lost the other one as well against UNC Wilmington. So, obviously, I think he brings a steadiness to the team. And one of the challenges Calipari's having, Chris, is – Last night, I think he played nine players, and it's really finding the identity. I like the starting lineup that Kentucky went with. They had Shepard at the point. Thierro got the start. Uh, Edwards obviously missing his second game in a row. Uh, and so not having those two, he and Wagner, I think really forced um, Calipari to see what he had in some other players. Dillingham played uh, a number of minutes. Shepard played all all 40 minutes, didn't, didn't come off the floor, which I know pleased a lot of people, finished with 24 points. So we know what – Cats know what they have in Shepard. I think it's really trying to figure out the rest of the pieces here because Wagner will be back, but now you have three seven-footers that all played last night. So uh, Calipari is getting to a point in the season, Chris, where he needs to find those seven or eight that he can go to, and I'm not, I'm not sure they're there yet. Uh, the good news is they still, still scored 91 points uh, with a load of talent that, that we have seen all year. Did I lose you? Sorry, should have hit on mute. Uh, look, Shepard is one of my favorite players in the league. I just think he he does yeah. so much. I mean, he let me just case in point. Box score line last night, 45 minutes, 24 points, three of seven on threes, uh, eight rebounds, six assists, three turnovers. That was a tie to season high. That was the only negative. Two steals and a block. So, like every, yeah, every box on a box score you could check, he did something there. Those, those kind of players tend to get underrated. But let's just say, best case scenario, he and he and fully healthy DJ Wagner back together. What does that look like optimally in terms of roles? 
Well, I think I think that's probably your starting backcourt for the rest of the way. I think that's Calipari will go with Wagner at point, and, and Shepard obviously can can slide over there, but is is great at, at at the two guard. Dillingham is electrifying; he's instant offense. I think those are your three players at at guard that he's going to feel comfortable with. So Kentucky's in good shape there. I think Wagner and Shepard. Uh, I think Edwards plays a much more diminished role moving forward. I think he'll get spot duty, and, and yeah. he's got an injury. They say a, a lower leg injury that's you know undisclosed in typical Calipari fashion. Uh, so we'll see what that looks like the remainder of the season. But I think Kentucky should be in good shape. They just need to to figure out who's going to fill out the rest of the the starting five. Uh, the uh, you know the other positions. I think Oyenzo had had you know a historic night in terms of. Uh, a yeah. double double. He also uh, had a number of blocks. Uh, I think one of the best stat lines, you know, uh, that Kentucky's seen at that position, maybe ever for a single game. Uh, so again, there were a lot of good things. Uh, the tail of the tape was though uh, was at the free throw line. Uh, Florida got to the free throw line a little bit more than Kentucky, and uh, and shot it better from from three point uh, land from yeah. distance. So, you know, in a game like that, you're just going to have to make plays. And uh, Kentucky just didn't make enough plays. And and honestly, I think going into the last three minutes of that game, I think they were up five, maybe with a minute and a half to play two minutes. And and Florida, you know, found a way to send it to overtime, which is never good. <laughs> I, I see a it. team. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and look, I mean, just just as a quick aside, I think Florida is really good. We had a brief conversation pre-podcast. They've Florida right. got a lot of parts. I mean, Florida had two guys that can score for them a lot. And, and have done so recently that the Kentucky held down last. And they're very similar teams. Their struggles right. come on the defensive end. They can beat you with a lot of places scoring wise. So I, I think this is a team in Florida that that is starting to rise towards a peak. And I think I think you're going to see their Florida's best play ahead. Just as an aside, but yeah, the, the underneath the the seven footers component is going to be interesting because look if the if not for the Wagner Shepherd dynamic, if Kentucky'd won the game, I think we would have led this with Donienso, who you mentioned had it had it almost had a triple double. He blocked right. eight shots. Um, you know, Bradshaw played nine minutes, and of course, you know, look a, a week ago or two weeks ago, we were raving about Big Z. We thought he might be the answer to all the problems. Now he's kind of relegated to a um, a minor reserve role. I, that that's the other thing I'm watching. Like, what what does this look like in March? Yeah, I think you'll, I think Oenzo is the starter at, at center with Bradshaw coming off the bench, and then Z will come in if there's if neither of those two are being effective. When you're in a game like, let's just look back to South Carolina, Oenzo really gives you the the only muscle that Kentucky has at that position. The other two, I just don't think have the have the physical stature to be able to, to compete and and be a, a, an enforcer, if you will, down on the blocks. Oenzo's shown that now through several games, so I think Cal will be confident with him. Uh, and then Bradshaw, the McDonald's All-American freshman coming off the bench, and then Z will come in. You know, if if they're if we get into a game, if the Cats get into the game where there's a uh, you know a shootout and it's just complete perimeter play uh, wide open, you'll see maybe um, Ivasich get in and maybe log some minutes for his shooting ability. But uh, again, um, I love Trey Mitchell. Um, I think yeah. obviously Reeves is a is an All-American candidate. Um, and so Kentucky obviously has the pieces to score with anybody. It's just a question of, you know, they can't stop anybody. You mentioned Shepard, you know, those those costly turnovers, and they were costly. They were at key moments where he got caught under the basket a couple of times and just was trying to make a play. Credit to him trying to make a play, but just, you know, was not able to find, um, you know, a teammate, uh, you know, getting caught under the basket like that. And Florida, you know, was able to take the ball the other way. And I think maybe um, scored on both of those late in the game, if I remember correctly. So, um, yeah, it's just, it's a really balanced league and anything goes, uh, to think that Kentucky's in fifth place right now in conference standings, you know, is, uh, is pretty interesting. There's a lot of talent in the sec. Yeah. And if you're looking for a little bit of silver lining, it's that Kentucky got one of its, it wasn't, he didn't play poorly. I, I wouldn't say, but like they didn't get a typical Trey Mitchell performance. I, one thing that I've noted about that guy is he's just been so consistent. Mm -hmm. Seemed like it's 15 and 10 every night. Last night he goes four, five, five and nine, yeah. five points was the lowest output he'd had since the, the pin game. 
Yeah. Um, which Kentucky won pretty comfortably. So I don't put a lot of stock into that. But I mean, there, there were between Wagner and that, th- there were some there were some levels that Kentucky had that it didn't get to. And sometimes it's just basketball when that happens. Yeah. Yeah. It was probably one of his worst games. And that there were some comments made during the game on that. It's like, oh, where's Mitchell? He missed, he missed a couple of uh, chippies down low. It just mm-hmm. didn't seem like, uh, you, you know, his, his typical self didn't shoot it well from distance, obviously. Uh, so they're going to need him to be that bolster. I mean, going to most games, Kentucky has counted on two people consistently. Uh, to to give them production, scoring production. That's Reeves and and Mitchell, and then the other pieces kind of have oscillated depending on who had the hot hand. Uh, they need both of those guys as upperclassmen if they're going to make a deep run this March. So look look for them to have a rebound. Um, yeah, again, Chris, it's a game. You look at Florida, no quad one wins yet until last night, and it's okay. Kentucky at home, Tennessee on deck. You need to win that game. Uh, and now you have a two-day turnaround to get ready for a Volunteers team who just came off a tough loss at home against South Carolina, who's a lot better yeah. than everybody thought as well. So it'll be interesting to see what happens on Saturday. Both teams desperate for a win. Yeah, and I just think it's going to be that kind of year in the SEC. Let me just run down the standings. Alabama 7-1 and one at the top. Yep. Hey, it, it was two weeks ago we had some big questions about Alabama. Get beat 91 to 71 in Knoxville. Defense had not been, I think, a, a calling card for, for Nate Oates like Nate Oates wants it to be on that end of the floor. Since then, beating Auburn, beating LSU, beating Georgia, and, and looked pretty good in doing it. Um, you know, Auburn, a couple weeks ago, we were talking about, hey, maybe Auburn is the best team in this league. Auburn went on the road twice, lost two games, still doesn't have a quad one win, I think. I'm doing this from memory. Yep. And it has lost its last two on the road. Right. South Carolina, uh, six and two. I, I'm still not convinced Carolina's in that top tier of three, four, maybe five teams, but the record is what it is, and Lamont Paris has done a terrific job. That team's good enough to play spoiler, as we know. T- Tennessee I, felt like a week ago Tennessee was the best team in this league. And yeah. then Tennessee got bullied by South Carolina at home. I could go down the line, mm-hmm. but it, it feels like there's enough uh, enough of this, hey, you know, we thought we were this, and, and, and maybe we're not all that. And it feels like it's happening to everybody. Well, yeah, uh, you mentioned South Carolina. I think South Carolina's the best defensive team in the conference. Uh, at mm-hmm. least they've proven they've they've proven that at least up to this point. We'll see how the rest of the schedule goes, but yeah, I think they're definitely in that conversation now. They have to be, uh, and it, it probably will be the best defensive team in that upper echelon of 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 programs that you mentioned. That's going to come out on top or finish, you know, first or second in the league. Uh, that's that's the deficit, right? We know a lot of teams can score a lot of points. Who's playing the best defense? And it's South Carolina right now. It's not Tennessee. It's not Alabama. It's certainly not Kentucky. So, you know, that'll be something to watch. It's like, okay, can South Carolina win down the stretch scoring 65 points a game and holding their opponents to 60 or or fewer? Well, they've done that. They've done a pretty good job of of that so far. So we'll see if they can keep it up. But, uh, but yeah, it, it does make for a fun, a fun, you know, SEC schedule, a lot of parody in the league. And, um, you know, do they all beat up on each other for the rest of the slate? And then how many teams mm-hmm. end up getting in to the tournament with, you know, potentially, you know, four or five conference losses? Because that's probably what it's going to look like. Yeah, I think right now, here's here's who's in. I think Alabama, Auburn, South Carolina, Tennessee, Kentucky. I think, and I'm not a, I haven't looked at bracketology or anything like that. I think that Florida... I think Florida Lunardi had as a bubble team heading into last night. I would presume that that a win at Kentucky would slide Florida in, depending on what other teams did. I think Florida's going to be good enough to get there in the end. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's what six Ole NCAA Miss, tournament maybe. teams. I think Ole Miss has won that yeah. seven. Yeah. I think Mississippi State has won that is eight. I don't know what to think of. Well, I do know what to think of a I think a can't shoot. But I think Buzz Williams has, has shown he's – got the ability to get a king there. It's got an old backcourt that's got to play better. Right. That's maybe nine. And and I wouldn't I wouldn't bury Georgia yet. No, no blowing that one to Alabama last night. Yeah. That would have been a chance for Georgia to take a step forward. It wouldn't have been in, but would have been closer to the bubble. So Georgia's got some work to do. I think you're going to see eight teams in the tournament. Yeah. 
may, maybe nine, and if everything lines up correctly, maybe ten. Ooh, ten. I don't. Yeah, that's. I, I, I don't. I don't really think it's going to be ten. I, I think Georgia would have to to win the right combination of games, but that's a team that on a lot of nights is good enough to. I mean, what right. what Georgia is right now is a team that's good enough to scare the socks off everybody and then can't hold it in the last five minutes. But yeah, they've got talent. Again, it's who's going to play the best defense. That, that sounds cliche, but it, it really is. I mean, Kentucky, <laughs> Kentucky's perimeter defense is non-existent. I mean, it's like, you know, you, you talk about, you know, F- Florida having a big game from, from three players last night, specifically all had over 20 points. Uh, there was just critical moments down the stretch where we, Kentucky just didn't guard the perimeter and open shots were hit and, and can't guard, you know, ball line defense to the, to the goal. I mean, it's, it's pretty simple, um, which again, a lot of teams are kind of falling, you know, victim to that. So, um, but yeah, uh, you know, I, I don't know what to expect for this game in, in Lexington against Tennessee this Saturday. Um, I don't, I, Tennessee will probably be a slight favorite in that game. I would, mm-hmm. I would guess. Um mm. It's going to be it'll be close to a pick on, but I'd say Tennessee's a small favorite. Um, I don't know if you've got an early line anywhere on that. Well, um, I, I don't. Ken Ken Palm and and Bart Torvik are usually close to the line. Um, Bart Torvik has got Tennessee favored by 0. 0.6 points. Yeah, and Ken Palm always got Tennessee by two. No, look, the the lines are usually off a little bit T- to me. I don't know. It, it it just doesn't sound right having Tennessee a favorite in Rupp Arena. Both are good teams. Is Tennessee probably favorite on a neutral floor? Yeah. I yeah. don't. I'm I'm not quite buying it. Yeah. I listen. It 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 depends on who's available. If Wagner's available, I, I like Kentucky's chances just to help manage the game and and p- provide a little bit better defense. Uh, you know, on the perimeter, and that's really what it's going to come down to. I think you're going to continue to see Oyenzo emerge as a as a as a consistent shot blocker. So rim protection is something you know Kentucky didn't have the luxury of early in the season. I think they're growing into that identity a little bit of being a um, a better defensive team down low. But we have got Kentucky's got to be able to stop you know uh, the dribble penetration, and and it's again there's it's not existent right now. So I love Tennessee in that regard. I I think. I think Kentucky fans are sleeping on Dalton Connect oh. uh, and, and his athletic ability. I think people think that he's just a spot up shooter. The guy can absolutely elevate and finish at the rim, and I don't think Kentucky it really appreciates that. They're they're going to see that on mm. on Saturday. So I think those factors. I think Tennessee's a favorite, and honestly, Tennessee's got a great shot to win the game because I who's going to be hungrier. Is is, yeah. is Kentucky going to be hungry to rebound off what just happened? Are they going to be you know beat up after you know which was a you know an overtime you know forty five minute game last night and and Tennessee might be fresher and more hungry. We'll see. I'm going to push back a little bit on something you just said. You you said Kentucky okay. fans they're sleeping on on Dalton Connect. I I there might be some, but Kentucky's got a Kentucky's one of those fan bases that. A lot of the fan base knows your team better than yeah. than their fans know their team. And anybody's watched Dalton connect this year, especially over the last three weeks, is is just your, your jaw hits the floor. This is a guy who can. It's not. It's not just the scoring. It's the everybody in the gym knows the ball's going there, and yeah. there's somebody in his face, and he pulls up and hits an off balance three anyway. That's why he is getting discussion as a lottery pick. But, the, yeah. Stuart, there's a flip side to that for Tennessee. And he's been so good, it started to get a little bit of the feel that everybody stands around and waits for him to make a play. Yeah. Uh, yeah I'll let I think, you speak for a minute. I'm sorry. No, I think that I think it's a good observation. I think you saw that against South Carolina the other night when the chips were down. I mean, they kind of looked around and – you could, you know, whoever was doing color, you know, commentated on, you know, the body language of the Tennessee team. Yeah. If if he's not, if he's not on, you know, what it, does everybody else, you know, pick up the slack? Are they waiting on him to, to make a play? I, when I just, when I say Kentucky's sleeping on him, it's more about his ability to finish and, and take people off the dribble. I think everybody knows he can shoot the ball, but I've yeah. been impressed how the kid, because of his length, how he can elevate and absolutely crush people around the rim he's not afraid of contact and Kentucky to this point really hasn't had an answer for a player like that um 
And then he also well, can, look, nobody yeah. has <laughs> right. Well, well that's what, but again, I'm I'm speaking in terms of historic. Yeah. You know, Calipari's yeah. always typically had pretty good defensive teams, right? I mean, yeah. this is this is his highest scoring team. He said it's also his worst defensive team. And I'm just looking at X's and O's, and I'm thinking about the rest of Tennessee's lineup. I think they match up really well against Kentucky. Um, they've got shooters, and you know, if Kentucky's not shooting the ball well, Tennessee has a chance to to you know blow people out when they're shooting really well. And, you know, that's what Kentucky needs to kind of think about. I think connect is just a handful and I'm not sure Kentucky has a plan on how to deal with everything he can do. So hopefully I'm wrong. I'd, I'd love to be wrong. Well, look, but, he scored 31 in his last time out in Tennessee still lost. No, like I, I think that game was a little bit of an outlier for Tennessee yeah, uh, Santiago, Santiago Vescovi was preseason first team All SEC, and, and not like the the eight man team, the five man team that they yeah. picked. He was Player of the Year preseason. He's been a supporting player. Um, Josiah Jordan yes. James feels like it, you know, hits a field goal, um, you know, about, about as often as my my nine year old willingly gets in the shower. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I but I think history shows those kids have a different level. I mean, Rick Barnes is a smart basketball coach. He's yes. going to look at. He's going to say, "Hey, look, we can't continue to do this as, as a one man show because we got other dudes out there." I think right. Tennessee will approach it differently. I think you'll see a more balanced effort. the The problem for Tennessee, as I see it, is that I think even if if it gets more out of those guys, is Tennessee a better defensive team? Yeah. I just think Kentucky can score from so many places that that's going to be problematic for Tennessee. Yeah, I, I think you'll I think you'll see a, I think the good thing about coming out of that game against Florida for Kentucky is I think you'll see a better effort out of Mitchell. I think you know Shepard Dillingham will continue to to shoot the ball. Reeves will continue to shoot the ball. I think he continues to be one of the the most reliable uh, offensive players in the conference. Uh, and then, you know, we'll see, you know, how the rest of the team responds and, and Wagner coming back as well. So I, listen, Kentucky loses this game. They fall to five and four in the mm. conference and they've got some opportunities, but not many left in the schedule. Chris, they have Tennessee and Knoxville. They have Alabama at home and they have to go to Auburn. Those are their three remaining big opportunities for, for solid quad one wins they need to win this game to go to not fall to five and four in the conference in conference play. So I see this as a must win. I'm just, you know, again, can they, can they turn around two days later, not even two days later and play maybe may have to play their best basketball of the season to, to beat Tennessee at home. That's my, well, point. look, um, let's, let's look at the recent series history. And I'm, I'm sure you remember this and probably if you're a Kentucky fan watching it, you, you do too. But last year, and, and for Kentucky, maybe this is different, okay, because it's a different cast of players every year. For Tennessee, a lot of these guys have played in these games. Last year it was 66-54. The year yep. before that, and, and I think Tennessee really had it rolling at the time. I'll have to double-check it, but that was the game that um, y you saw the score and you're like, what just happened? That was the 107 79 game uh both those were in Lexington my, my point is and, and maybe they just maybe those games haven't but it recently Kentucky has sort of had its way with with Tennessee and in Lexington yeah I, again all those things sound reasonable uh I, I just this year is again Kentucky still has a revolving lineup depending on who's available there are a lot of players continuity wise Tennessee knows who they are I think uh, you know, yeah. they've got, some, they've got veteran players. They've got people that have been there. It's just a different year. And, you know, if, if Kentucky were set as far as, you know, who their go-to players are, we're, you know, trying to figure that out in real time, right in the meat of conference schedule is not the best place to be. I think you look at it, everyone looks at Kentucky. It's like, wow, they, they're averaging 91 points, number one offensive team in the country. They've got it dialed in. They got a lot of playmakers. They don't have a, a system as far as all, you know, a team dialed in yet. I mean, I, I don't care who you are. I mean, you look at them, it's like, okay, who are you? It's like, everybody can play. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who's going to be your go-to seven people, that, you know, for a tournament run. And I think they've got to figure that out quickly or else this is just a kind of an offensive sideshow. I mean, I hate to say it, man. It's, you know what I mean? It's like, wow, they're fun to watch. Yeah. They've lost yeah. seven conference games. 
Yeah, but they sure were high scoring. <laughs> well, I mean, let me. This, this is funny. Um, I, I've gotten. <laughs> you know, we have an SEC podcast, and I've I've pointed out some of. I feel like we're having a role reversal here. I pointed out yeah. some of Kentucky's things that have bothered me. Yeah. Um, now I'm the one trying to talk you off the ledge here a little That's bit. That's right. But, but yeah. um, th this is where it kind of comes full circle. And and I look, I've said for a while, and you've seen this with some of Cal's teams when th they look like they're okay mid February, and, th and then late in the year they turn it on, they get to postseason, they're they're a real headache to deal with. I don't know if you listen to Gary Parish's podcast with with Kevin Norlander on College Basketball. It's really good. And at some point in the podcast, they brought up yesterday that the defensive efficiency, because it's always, we get to March and it's those stats like, well, you, you can't win the national title unless you got at least one McDonald's all American and all these things that say never this and never that he made an interesting point. Um, I think Baylor was the lowest rated defensive team in the Ken Palm area to win a national title with it. The lowest rated defensive efficiency team. I think Baylor was 44. That was also during the COVID year. Right. Where we had, you know, everything was chaotic and and yeah. nobody had a a lot of games weren't played. So I, I think that's kind of but the interesting thing was to get to a final four, the bar was a lot lower. Uh Miami, I think 139 and adjusted defensive efficiency coming into to the tournament. Mm -hmm. VCU, I think, was in the 120s. There were a couple other teams that were like in the 90s or, or low 100s. Sure. sure. And th the point was, you can be a mediocre defensive team if your offense is good enough or you're lucky enough to get to the final four. The problem is once you get there, the, the other teams you're facing can defend, and that's where it falls apart. So just, just something to watch. Yeah, well, I mean, Kentucky's probably, I don't know where they are as of today in Ken Palm as far as deficient efficiency, but it's its certainly, I bet it's lower than both, you know, certainly lower in Baylor and, and, and Miami. And again, it's, you know, in a single game situation, uh, you know, a high scoring team can win, but at some point you're going to be, you're going to have to make some stops, right? Yeah. In, in that format. And um, yeah, it, it's it, it's going to catch up with them sooner or later. It's it's fun to watch. I mean, I sat last night and watched the team. I was like, wow, what a you know down the stretch. This is what a you know people are making shots, unbelievable shots. What a great game. You look up and you're like, you know, final score. You lose by three. It's like okay, like now what? And it's you know then you get into these must win situations for from a seating standpoint. And again, Kentucky's got four solid quad one opportunities to bolster its tournament resume. If they can go three and one, I feel really good about it. And this Saturday's one they'd have to win because um, there's no guarantees on on any of them uh, beyond that. Um, so, yeah. And here's the other thing, too. Can you improve markedly def from a defensive standpoint, you know, between now and tournament time in the next three weeks? Yeah. I, I, I don't know. Do you just start, you suddenly show up and start being locked down defenders? I don't think it works that way. So. I think they are what they are. They just they've got to find their best their best set pieces, and that's what they got to go with. So, any parting thoughts on the way out? <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to end on something positive. Uh, no, I, I I do feel I keep trying to help you out there, Stuart. <laughs> Thank you. I know this has been a therapy session on this one today. No, I do feel good about Oyenzo. I think I they I, they have been wanting someone to step up, step up over the last few weeks to be that enforcer. I think he's your, he's your guy going forward to, to start. I think you feel good about that. I think you feel good about Trey uh, Mitchell, um, you know, coming off, you know, a slump and, and playing well down the stretch as a senior, you feel good about Reeves. You feel good about the pieces. It's these other, you know, it's, it's just going with the set lineup and feeling confident that, you know, night in and night out, they're going to be able to deliver, uh, you know, on both ends of the floor. And again, not to sound like Calipari, but they're freshmen. A lot of them, they're going to make freshman mistakes. And so sometimes you don't know what you're going to get. But make no mistake, they are an extremely talented offensive team. No one would would second guess that statement. So um, so we'll see. They're going, to have, they're going to have an opportunity. That's that's what's exciting. They're going to have an opportunity. After that, Kentucky comes to our hometown of Nashville to face Vanderbilt. Uh, so we'll have that to talk about next week. Interesting game coming up after that. Uh, Kentucky will be facing Gonzaga a week from Saturday. That, that'll that be a very interesting one. That'll be one of those quad yeah. one win opportunities that you referred to, or may, maybe quad two, depending on where Gonzaga is yeah. at the Could moment. Be, yeah. But it'll be right on that border. Uh, either way, good, bad, and different, we'll be here to talk about it. Uh, yeah. For Stuart Lackey, thanks for joining me. I'm Chris Lee. 
This is Southeastern 14 presented by Bet Online.